people are so reluctant, so reluctant to what we would call niche, right? Niching down or, or, or being narrow focused. And that's what's costing them. Today's show is brought to you by Audible. Audible is offering you, dear listener, a free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership. Just go to audibletrial.com forward slash midlife. The link is in the show notes, so you can get started listening today to an audiobook that will help you turn your entrepreneurial ideas into reality. Hello, fellow midlife entrepreneurs. This is Kevin Boyd, business coach, entrepreneur, and all-round psychology nerd, bringing you interviews with people on the same entrepreneurial journey as yourself, hoping to inspire you to change your thinking, take action, and bring your vision to the world. In this episode of the Midlife Entrepreneurs Podcast, we meet Mark LaRoust, life coach and founder of the Unconventionalist Podcast and also a movement to help a new wave of entrepreneurs turn their message into a movement. Mark is an author, TEDx speaker, and all-round disruptor in the world of business development. In this episode, we discuss everything from the power of coaching to how the most critical indicator of success in business is your ability to focus in on doing just one thing very well. I learned a lot from talking to Mark, and I hope you do too. I want to welcome Mark LaRoust, uh, the unconventionalist. I've been practicing that all morning, the unconventionalist <laughs> uh, and life coach extraordinaire. Um, we, we met back in 2012, was it? On the uh... Yeah, it was. We met in February. I believe it was February or end of January, but I think it's a very early February. I put almost bet, put my hand to bet. Uh, in London, 2012, during the uh, Coactive Training Institute Fundamental Weekend. Wow. Yeah. That's what seven years ago. Yeah, seven years ago. And then and then you and I had some uh, interesting adventures. You came to Morocco when you know to cover the the event with me when we went over to do that retreat and um Yes, I always uh, described it to people. I said I've just been on a yoga, surfing and life coaching retreat. Yeah, and they were like, What? It. I've never heard those three together. No. So you were a pioneer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Will that retreat happen again? That was about well, three. Yeah, I think th- some form of it will. Yeah, I loved it. It was one of my favorite things. I've done nothing to date for sure. Like, I still one of my peak experiences is to go back to that moment when we're on the terrace and everybody's kind of doing group activities and it's sunny and there's a buzz in the air and I'm looking out and I can see the waves coming in, uh, knowing that we're going to go out and do some surfing at some point and and doing some yoga. And actually, I can I can see the the surf behind you, which reminds me of the first book you wrote. Yeah, so I'll take you back to 2012 then. So what, what made you turn up in that room in Clerkenwell in February 2012 and think, yeah, I want to yeah. train to be a coach? Well, I mean, depending how long you have, but I'll try and make this as short and as, as, as concise as possible. But, you know, I did the whole typical thing, um, you know, went to school, was told, if you behave and you get good grades and you go to university, if you get a good university and you get a good grade, you get a good job. If you do that for the next 40 years, you can hope to climb up the ladder and hopefully by then becoming a partner or a director or whatever it is. And then retire when you're 70 or 65, get the gold watch and then enjoy life. That was the plan. I mean, everybody, you know, as you know, that like, that's kind of what everyone um, was, was selling. And, um, and I think, my first job at Australia University was a corporate gig. I traveled around the world. I was living in emerging economies like Kazakhstan, um, you know, the Gambia, Peru, uh, and all that kind of stuff. And uh, delivering these kind of reports on countries. And it was amazing. I discovered some really great stuff, but uh, it wasn't really aligned with what I now know are called values. Back then, I didn't know what the hell that meant. It was kind of like, well, it just doesn't feel right. That, that's kind of how I describe it. There's something not quite right. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm glad you said that because often people come to coaching, don't they, with that sort of a feeling. It's just a feeling yeah. something's not quite right. Yeah, well, yeah, that's right. It's like either, either, usually I find it usually comes from it's something not quite right or there's something more that, that, that I'm not, you know, expressing or there's more that I have to give or there's more that I have to experience, you know, something like that. And, and uh, yeah, and so I, I kind of quit that job, went through what, you know, every self-proclaimed millennial, um, 
would 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 say I went through a quarter life crisis, you know, at the ripe age of twenty five, and I didn't know what I wanted to do, or you know, it was really lost and it was very confusing because I had this very kind of high profile job, and from the outside it looked super successful and great, and I was hobnobbing with ministers and presidents and celebrities, and I just wasn't that happy. So I came back and. Um, to loop it back to your question, I think around 2009 is when I quit um, the job eventually. And I went through a bit of a dark time, like a bit like, you know, what I would probably recognize as some form of depression or some form of just, you know, mental breakdown. What do you want to call it? I was just really low. I was just feeling like absolute crap. I didn't recognize myself. I didn't want to get out of bed. I was, you know, overeating, not exercising, not wanting to socialize. I mean, all, all the constantly tired. Um, troubles of sleeping all this stuff and my mum basically invited me for dinner and on that dinner there were some uh friends of my parents who've known me when i was a really really young kid from when i was like three or four who used to live in our neighborhood who were americans and living in america and my mum goes oh royer mark's depressed can you fix him and mark royer's a, a a coach or something she'll fix you we kind of both laughed. And it turns out that Roya was a life coach. I didn't know what a life coach was, but she was a life coach and she was trained with CTI as well. And so we sat down and she kind of laughed. She's like, what's going on? How are you doing? And, and that conversation basically led her to say, look, I'll, oh no, that was it. If, you, if you're ever open to coaching, reach, reach out to me. And then I continued and I did some stuff. And then I, I remember I injured myself. I did an amateur mixed martial arts tournament for charity for November, which is the stupidest thing I've ever done because I still suffer to this day from a knee injury. But I, I went through really another second low phase. I was doing quite well, but then I went through another second low phase. And I reached out to her and I said, hey, um, and it's in the book I wrote actually back in 2013. I wrote that I actually verbatim posted the letter. And, um, and that's it. And so she took me on as a client. And it's really cliche and really cheesy and really kind of, it sounds, you know, very self-fulfilling in that sense. But um, it was, yeah, it was life-changing. It really was. It changed my life in the sense that for the first time I had a space where I could open up, explore, dream, discuss without having any sense of judgment, without having any sense of possibility or not possibility. It was just more of a space to explore, just like, ah, oh, cool. So what's that about? And, you know, and I loved it so much that I thought, because it helped me so much. And I ended up doing a video CV and that went viral. And then I landed my dream job at the November foundation where I became country manager, you know, spent four years there raising 2.8 million euros for men's health, got 110,000 people to sign up with a bunch of awards. And really, if you look back, it, it started off on my journey of, um, and actually if I'm really honest, before the conversation I had with Roya, I discovered like online kind of motivational stuff you know, Tony Robbins was one of the first guys I came across. And he was a bit, for me, a little bit OTT. He was a bit like, mm -hmm. you got to believe and change your state. You know, it was all this kind of stuff. And I was like, what? But a lot of the stuff that he was saying made sense to me. It was basically, he was the first one, I think, who, who, who gave me the concept of you're at choice. Like, you, 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 you know, you're at choice with, with and the questions you ask, all this stuff. And there was also one of my mom's friends called Pamela McNeil, which I give, I've got to give credit to her because she was the very, very first coach ever who I met even before Roya. And she was really passionate about helping students. She worked in this MBA and she was like helping students with their careers. And she said, look, we can have a chat and maybe I can help you out. What do you want to really want to do? And she introduced this concept of like, forget about maybe job titles and, and areas of industry, but like, what is it that makes you come alive? And this kind of weird stuff. And so eventually in 2012, when I did land my dream job, oh no, that was before, sorry. Uh, when I was still in my old job, I, I said to my coach, I said, oh, I'd love to become a coach one day. And she challenged me. She said, well, get yourself a client. And I hadn't done any training. I hadn't even gone to this whole CTI route. And I felt terrified. And so I used to train in this mixed martial arts gym next to my parents' hometown. And uh, I still remember this guy. I asked him, I said, look, I'm doing this, I've got this crazy idea. I want to have a client. Would you be my client? And I took him on. I had no idea what I was doing. And... Um, and it was really powerful for him. Like it really, and all, all I had was just a conversation with him. I just asked him questions. That's it. And then that's when I thought, okay, that's, um, that's, I want to do this. I'm really excited. And I've had like multiple, you know, passion hats. And every time I found him, my brother would be like, okay, here we go. What's the next thing? Um, and it was coaching 2012. And I came back from that fundamental weekend when I met you. Um, and, uh, and I was like, this is it. I want to do this. This is, this is special. It's like, I really found my tribe. I found, a way of being. I found a way of like that, and that's 
that's how we met and the rest is you know history i think what i, what I love about what you've just said there is that thing of identifying the feeling which often we, we call it depression but depression is just telling you you're stuck mm. you know it's your body and mind's way of saying this just isn't working anymore you know we need to stop doing this but it's like we have to go through the long long night of darkness to come out the other side because mm. that thing of you've got to maybe not always but often you have to hit some kind of bottom some kind of where yeah. where all your strategies just stop working yeah, yeah and you know and anyone's interesting listening to this um you know, there's some, there's some work you can explore further right, with Joseph Campbell around the hero's journey and especially the book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, mm. where he explores this concept where we continuously go through this pattern of calling forth. And, and what's interesting is that if you, if, you, if you look into the hero's journey and, you know, people can go and dive into it, but, but it's basically, it's what's, you know, birthed all the Hollywood movies that we know, all the stories that we know, you know, from the Harry Potters to the um, Little Mermaid to Star Wars to, um, yeah, Cinderella, all that stuff. And, and the idea is, is that sometimes we're going to have a call to adventure. And, and if we don't take it, something's going to happen. Some stuff happens. And they usually call it like, you know, the death, divorce, disease. Um, you know, whether you get fired, you lose your house, you lose someone, you get an illness, like whatever it is, we'll throw you and we'll force you out and, and take that action. And I think we all go through that in some stages and some of us resist it longer than others. Um, but, you know, what's really interesting is that, especially for your audience, I, I ran a 12 week, this is 2016. I ran a 12 week uh, career change um, kind of accelerator with a colleague who's amazing called Sophie Miller. And there were probably the youngest were around 25. And then, you know, on the, on the old spectrum, there's probably like 55, something like that, maybe plus. And what we found is that it, it wasn't a generational thing. It was a human thing. It was like people wanted to feel like what they did made a difference. People f wanted to feel like they were respected and uh, appreciated and all this stuff. And so, it was really interesting actually to see that this happens at any point in life. The, the only difference is that you'd have someone in their fifties, the biggest question they'd have when their forties, even they'd be like, is it too late? Is, yeah. it, is it, is it too late for me to, to do this thing, whether that's a career change or starting a business or whatever it is. And it's fascinating. It's fascinating to me because it's, 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 it's only too late the day you die. I think that's when it's too late. You know, the moment you're gone, that, that, yeah, there's nothing you can do then. I think I've just got my new strap line for my, uh, my website, yeah. The Midlife Entrepreneur. And, and that's actually, I love the fact you said that because that's exactly why I set this up. It was like, I meet so many people in the middle of their lives and they've just got all this incredible experience and they think, well, I've missed the boat. It's too late. You know, I'm not 25 anymore. I'm 45. And they go, wow, you've got 20, 25 years of experience. That's incredible. Yeah. You know, like what could you do yeah. with that? Yeah, and the challenge you have with that is you have to help them unlearn a lot. Because when you've got 25 years of working in an organization, you've got an excessive amount of experience, which is brilliant. You've also been um, formatted a certain way for 25 years. Yeah. And so you have to, the, one of the courageous things that people do when they work with you, when they come across you, is to be willing to take off some of those kind of conformities and boxes and, and having to operate out of that, which is scary. For people listening to this, it's totally, I totally get it. It, it, it is. You know, I think the longer you're in it, the scarier it is, for sure. You know, it's interesting. Again, I interviewed Danielle Laporte on my podcast on The Unconventionalist and, and she never went to university and she actually thinks it's one of the best things she's done because she's never had to unlearn. She's never had to get out of a box, you know. Um, I'm not saying people should or shouldn't go to university. That's not what I'm saying, but it, it's, it's to normalize that people listening to this can feel scary. But I've seen it over and over and over again. You know, people changing careers, people starting later in life, and as you said, you've got all this depth of experience. Hopefully, uh, you're a little bit more financially secure, perhaps. And even if you're not, you're know, still always around it. Um, and there's something beautiful about when people just decide to follow their curiosity. You know, I, a bit like yourself, I've, I've done a lot of pivots in my life. You call them passion hats. <laughs> and I made a list the other day uh, since the age of 16, and I'm now yeah. 53, I pivoted the ones I can remember about 22 times. <laughs> now, you, 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 you millennial you. Yeah. So I, I was millennial before there was a millennium, you know. I'm, yeah. 
Hey, by the way, do you know, do you want to hear something crazy? I've been listening to, I'm just going to geek out for a second. I've been listening to 13 Minutes to, Mar, uh, to, to the Moon. Me too, yeah. Yeah, BBC. Isn't it crazy? The average age of that entire operation was, was 27. Yeah. So millennials, basically today's millennials. Imagine if today's millennials put the first woman or, or man on Mars or something. Anyway. Just well, I, I think what, you know, it's that thing, there's nothing more dangerous or powerful in this world than an idea. And once yeah. you get an idea and people get behind it, they say 400,000 people were behind that idea to get them to the moon. And in seven years, they took it from like nothing and put yeah. a man on the moon, which was so complicated with computers, yeah. you know, from 60, 50, 60 years ago, which hardly do yeah. anything. So, well, they, they say that, the, uh, you know, not, not even an ounce of the technology that we hold on our phones yeah. is what they had back then. You know, it's crazy. Yeah. I, the episode on the computer fascinated me because I'm an ex-programmer and it only had 4K of working memory, 4K, which I don't even know how to explain that to a millennial. That's a number so small. <laughs> Your pocket calculator probably has about that memory. Yeah, isn't that crazy? It's just, it's, <laughs> it's amazing. Anyway. So where were we uh, before we geeked out there? Uh, we talked about uh, what, what, why people come to you and this question about it's too late and then... Yeah, it's too late, yeah. Yeah. And I love what you say, it's, it's only too late on your, on your deathbed. Yeah, you should have. A th this might be taken already, but you might have a tagline, which is, uh, we know we believe in life before death. Yeah, I like it. I like it. Um, so, you know, I've met a lot of coaches over the last sort of seven or eight years, and I'm always fascinated by you know, that concept of the wounded healer, like why did we become a coach? Well, we became coach because we needed it ourselves. You know, mm. you, you've said that very clearly yeah. as well. So over those seven years of being a coach, what do you think is the biggest thing you've got from, from coaching yourself? Oh, oh my God. Where do I even begin? What is the biggest thing I got? I think, I think your clients are often a reflection of your own stuff. Mm. I think you can only take a client as far as you've been. I, d I didn't really used to believe that, but I do believe that now. That it's hard as a coach to take a client to places that you haven't dared to go or that you haven't been willing, you know. So I think it's been an opportunity for me to, to grow, definitely. Like from a selfish perspective, coaching is, you know, it's, again, it was interesting. I was interviewing someone the other day, uh, uh, Rona or Rona, I never know how to pronounce her name. Rona Steinberg, who just wrote a book called uh, Live Out Loud. Um, you might have met her through the whole CTI thing. But anyway, we're having this interview. And at one point in the middle, she just kind of gets a bit, she goes, oh, you're really intense. And I would never describe myself as intense. That's not the word I would describe myself, right? And, and, what, what I was, and I think what she meant is that because I've, I've done quite a lot of work on myself, because I've done quite a lot of work with people, I'm quite comfortable being present with someone and just stare at them in the eye and not lose eye contact, ask yeah. some deep and meaningful, powerful questions and shut up and be with it and stay with it. And that for people can feel intimidating or intense or whatever you want to fill, fill up the gap. Um, so I think definitely it's made me uh, a more rounded uh, human. So I think it makes me a better, a better father a better partner, uh, a better, a better kid, a better sibling, a better, you know, leader, better manager, all, all these things, better coach for sure. Um, and then what I've learned about people, you know, it's really interesting. I think it's interesting because it, it reflects the experience I've spoken to other people. There's, there's a guy in America who's interviewed 400 people in his podcast, one of the top podcasts in, in, in the world. You know, he's interviewed a lot of celebrities, all this stuff. And I asked him, what is the one thing you found in common through all your guests? And he says, we're all fragile, that we're all fragile. And I was like, what do you mean by that? He's like, we all have something that is getting in our way. You know, whether that's insecurity, that little voice, that unwanted guest, that saboteur, that gremlin, that whatever you want to call it, um, that it lives inside of us, that is really our own worst enemies and that we are more afraid than we let the world know, that we have more insecurities than people know about. And, and I think that's interesting because I think I've had now, what is it, seven years? I've had iterations of my coaching practice, right? 
And now to this day, my, 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 actually my primary gig is I'm a speaker. That's, that's where I make, you know, my, 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 my biggest living. I have still one-to-one -one clients and I still have some, you know, some coaching clients who you know, I love working with, but primarily I'm a, I'm a, I'm a speaker and trainer now. Um, and I went through different iterations of coaching. And the reason why I mentioned this is I started off with people wanted to change careers. I then worked with people who wanted to start businesses. I then worked for a while with life coaches who wanted to build businesses. Um, that have been a mix. Now I'm working with CEOs and executives, you know, managing huge companies and PLLs and all this stuff. And what you find is that actually across all of them, um, it always comes down to the same thing. Am I enough? Do I love myself? I mean, really, that, that's, that's all it is. It does, everything else is just noise. I find, I mean, that's what I found. It, it, we always, at some point in that dynamic, in that conversation, we will always come across that point that says, what are your child wounds? And, you know, at least like, do you think you're enough? Do you think you deserve this? Do you, do, are you lovable? Do you think you're still lovable? Even, you know, all this stuff that I find is, is the human normalization. Like we all have this, we all have that. Yeah, I mean, they, they do say that, the deepest darkest fear that we all have underneath everything when you strip it all away is am i lovable yeah you know because that is our foundation experience as children we're trying yeah. to work out whether our parents love us or not some parents yeah. show it really well and you get that message very clear like yeah i am lovable i'm fine so you grow up yeah. quite secure but most of us didn't get enough of that feedback um, yeah. particularly my generation parents back then it yeah. just wasn't how you did it. You know, that wasn't the norm. I think it is yeah. much more the norm now. Parents are much better at, at giving their children positive feedback. You could almost argue maybe too much. <laughs> so yeah, some, think, some kids think, are growing up. Honestly, with you, that, that whole conversation for me kind of, I have an opinion about that. I, I don't even think it's about positive feedback. I, I think it's just about having a conversation. I think the biggest change is just talking. And, 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 and actually being able to talk about feelings and, and stuff like that. And I mean, I look at my dad's dad, right? It's like my granddad and my dad had a, such a strange dynamic for me when I think about it. Because I only realized becoming a dad myself and seeing other men and seeing other men with their dads, how lucky I was that my dad was very physical in the sense that, you know, he hugged me. And still to this day, like he, he came over for my parents. My parents had their 42-year wedding anniversary on Tuesday. And he was at home, we were having dinner. At one point, we, I was holding, and I found myself, I was just holding hand with my dad, and I'm just holding my dad's hand, and I'm thinking, wow, how lucky am I that, that I can have that, that my dad taught me that it's okay to show emotions and feelings and love to your kids, you know, as, as a male figure. And I think a lot of my friends, a lot of people I know have never had that. You know, I, I heard a story of a friend who told me that when his dad left the home for, for, for a woman that, that he'd, he'd met and that he wanted to leave his family, before he left to live in a different country and basically leave his, the kids behind and the wife and all this stuff, he shook his hand. Like he shook his hand saying, all right, be a good boy and, you know, take care of your mom. And that was, that was the last thing before his dad left, shaking his hand. And, I, you know, it moves me as a dad because I'm thinking, wow, how, you know, that is such a strange, but then you've got to go and lay as maybe his dad, that's how his dad was with him. And so when I asked my dad, I was like, why were you able to be physical and expressive and emotive with me? when your dad wasn't. And, and he said, well, it just, it just felt natural to me. Like he just, he, you know, he, and, and I'm so grateful for that. And, and, I, and I think, um, and I think it's, it's this, there's a shift in generation. Even if you look at millennial dads, there's a study from the dad index, I think it's called, um, that I, I interviewed the guy who was behind it. It was really interesting. Millennial dads are the most involved dads in any generation when it comes down to, um, taking care of the kids and changing nappies, buying stuff, cooking, all this stuff, anything. So having a shift, we're having a shift in dynamic around that, which I think is interesting. Um, and I think the whole conversation about there's too much positive feedback. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure there are people who, who kind of think the sun shines and the kid's ass and there's no wrongdoing. Um, it's getting the balance right, isn't it? I mean, you know, yeah. if, you if you tell your child constantly, they're amazing, they can do anything yeah. and everything they do is wonderful. That's not very helpful to them. They need no, to no, also know where their, where their limits are as well. It's like, well, yeah. you know, as they say, you, you praise the effort, not necessarily the result. So it's like, right. oh, you see, you tried right, really hard. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Like, you know, I saw that you were really committed. 
and you really, you know, you gave it all. And I don't care what the final thing, and I don't think you should be giving gold medals for people for participating. I don't, you know, I, I don't believe in all that. I think that's just silly. Uh, but I do believe that we, ha we, we are changing. Like th those conversations are changing, you know. And as you said, generations, generations are changing. And yet, we, you know, there's... there's um, it's uh, Adam Grant. He did some studies at Facebook around the intergenerational wants and needs around purpose and meaning. And um, he actually found that it, whether they were 20 or 50 or 60, um, actually it, it almost became more prolific in the, in the older, older ages around wanting to give back and, and make a difference because they felt like they had more to give back, that time was running out, and that they actually have an urge to, to do meaningful work. So it's universal. Yeah, I, th I, think, I think a lot of stuff, yeah, so seven years of coaching has taught me that there's a lot of universal truths. We're all very different. We're all very unique. We've got like we we but there's so we have so much in common. I think more than we have uh, that separates us. Yes, we tend to focus on our differences more than our similarities, which are yeah. much much greater our similarities than our differences. Yeah, I mean it's funny. I'm wearing a t-shirt today. Everyone's been giving me the looks, but it basically says not left, not right, forward. Yes, and and, and I think it's because there's this, um, especially now, right, with the, the politics happening and. Brexit and Donald Trump and Boris Johnson and all this stuff, whatever your uh, positions are on all those conversations, I think we could become so siloed in our, in our views. And this goes back again to people wanting to start businesses in, in later stages of their life. If you're too anchored in your way of thinking, if you're too fixed and too rigid, you're going against the grain of being an entrepreneur and starting a business. You, you have to have a flexible and growth mindset and all this stuff. It's, otherwise, it gets harder. Because that, that was one of my questions was what, you know, when you were starting out your business, you know, the unconventionalist, um, what, what was the key kind of skill or mindset that you found that helped you the most? Because when you begin it, it's like everything has to be done. You know, you've just got an idea yeah. in your mind and it's so yeah. easy to put that mind out, that idea yeah. out of your mind. So yeah. what, what, are you aware of now all these years later? Like, oh, I'm still, I, I, well, to be honest with you, I think I'm still still going through it. I'm still discovering it every time. I'm like, you know, now I've got a team, like I've got a team of two. And so now you, you, now you kind of, now I'm learning Wow, well, like managing a team and you know, it's, it adds another layer to your, to your, to your work, which is really interesting. And I'm very grateful for, for, um, you know, for, for the team members I have and stuff, I guess, oh gosh, the, the first, the, the, the first thing I'd say is the biggest lesson I've learned is focus. Mm -hmm. Um, focus because i think the biggest pitfall 95 percent of all the biggest problems i see especially in the coaching world and service business world consulting world is uh, people are so reluctant so reluctant to what we would call niche right niching down or or, or being narrow focused and that's what's costing them that's what's costing them success a hundred like i i know now that to be true on 99% of each case. You'll find a 1% that defies that odd, but 99% of the time, everyone I've met who's been very successful at what they do, who made a name for themselves, their business has done well, they've gone all in on one. I'll give you an example. I visited Innocent, uh, the smoothie company, you know, the other day, the HQ, after 15 years of really dreaming of wanting to go and visit them, I was invited. And they've got this beautiful section in the building. Uh, between each floor, they have these different kind of like, um, museums almost, uh, sections, whatever you want to call them. And one of them is called Innocent Heaven. And it's all the products that either had a short term life or just didn't work out. And they wanted to thank them. And so they have all these kind of little bottles of wings on. It's very funny. It's very cool. And then I saw veggie pots. There would be veggie pots. And I don't even you remember, but at one point Innocent were doing veggie pots. They were selling food, but they stopped. They discontinued it because it just wasn't working. So they went back to their and I think that's what happens a lot. I think a lot of people will start off by going, I want to be an innocent company, so I'm going to do smoothies, I'm going to do protein chains, I'm going to do coconut water, I'm going to do veggie pots, I'm going to do uh, protein balls, I'm going to do, do you see what I'm saying? They're going to go for that. The, that's the metaphor for what everyone starts off with. I'm going to do all these things. Whereas, take another example, like Sanctus, right? I talk about them a lot in my work because I think they're great. Um, they could have, they, they're, they're a mental health startup that are trying to change the taboo around mental health and they provide uh, mental health coaches within companies because their goal is to create the first mental health uh, gym on the high street. So until then they're doing mental health gyms in companies, but 
they went all then that's all they do all they do are they put a coach in a company and people can go in and have a conversation for 45 minutes or whatever they 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 were told you could do leadership training you could do hr consulting you could do all these things and they said no to all those things and they just went all in on that the result in three years they grew from one to 13 with 35 associate coaches and they've made their seven figure year this year so it's it's just and I see this. I could give you a thousand examples like that over and over and over again. So if I could go back, and it would be to to fight the resistance to 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 be afraid of narrowing down and niching onto something, and to go all in on that. I think that's the number one. The number two, I would say, is it's so easy to get excited by all the stuff that doesn't matter. Things like websites, business cards. Logos, names, titles, blog posts, all this stuff, doesn't matter. That is the exciting stuff because you're behind a laptop, behind a screen, or you're talking to someone you're hiring. So it's a super safe space. Mm. Like one of my favorite um, examples for this is Noah Kagan. I think he's, I think he's, really, I think he's really switched on, the guy who founded AppSumo, now called Sumo, um, who's friends with Tim Ferriss, who I know you know. Um, and there's a brilliant video. You can check it out. You can put it in the show notes. It's basically, if you type in Noah Kagan and Tim Ferriss creative live on YouTube, it, it'll come up. It's an episode where, um, it, it really is the definition of what I think is the biggest pitfall of all businesses is that sometimes as entrepreneurs, we're so attached to our idea that we're not listening to what the market wants. Okay. We're not listening to what the market needs. So we have this idea, like I, I've got an example years ago. I, I used to have ideas all the time. And years ago, I had this idea of doing a water bottle for men with uh, milestones that you had to reach when you drank. Okay, so you would be like, you know, it, they would appear like you legend or you're getting hot. And, you know, so just to get people to hydrate more because hydration was such an important part of all this stuff. Anyway, so what did I do? Did I go through the manufacturing process of looking for company bottles and heat warming systems and blah, 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 and spending thousands of pounds in patterns? And No, I didn't. I took an old pasta jar of sauce, cleaned it, took a black felt tip pen, put a few markers on it, like, well done, Ryan Gosling, whatever, you know, like some few jokes. I took my phone, recorded myself saying, hey, guys, I'm going to make, manually make five of these. They're going to cost five pounds. If you want one of them, PayPal me five pounds to this email address, and I'll ship them over. Put that on Facebook, and I've got a lot of people taking the piss. Are you, did, you, are you just, did you just try to resell a, a, a pasta jar? But three people bought it, you know? Um, that, is, that is what people don't do. We don't validate our ideas quick enough because we're afraid, we're scared. That's when, the, that's, you, know, that's when you hit the road. So, so like if, you, if you're listening to this, you've got a bit of sign think, I think this would be a great idea. Great, take my challenge, okay? If you only had seven days and you only had 100 pounds to validate your idea, would it work? If it doesn't, then you're either overcomplicating it or your idea just isn't going to stick. It's just as simple as that. You know, that's when I wanted to launch a plant-based protein company. I gave myself seven days and hundred pounds. That's how the seven day startup challenge starts it. Um, and I went to a festival. I had 42 shakes that, that I built recipes for. And it's a long story. And I sold out, made nine pounds. It was the best profit I've ever made in my life. I was so excited. But it worked and everybody, and, and, you, and, you, and, you, and, you, and it's, really, it's really interesting. When you see good ideas, they take and people get excited about it. And, and they're, very, they're usually very simple. You know, November, when I used to be the country manager of November, it's a simple idea. Grow a mustache for 30 days. Raise awareness about prostate cancer, men, men's mental health, et cetera, et cetera. And raise some money to stop men dying so young. It's so easy. Like, just grow a mustache, do some good. That's it. As soon as you start complicating it, as soon as there are layers, it's difficult. And then the third would be educate yourself, you know, mm -hmm. read some stuff, uh, which, which is contradictory to my fourth point, which would be create, stop consuming. That's the other thing. Like, I think it's very easy as entrepreneurs or wannabepreneurs or, you know, starting up that we just consume, oh, one more course. You know, I think it's called, you know, then it can become self-development porn where it's just kind of like you're just addicted to it and you just want to do the next workshop and the next workshop and the next workshop and the next, because you get addicted to the high, you get addicted to the possibility, you get addicted to the learning, but it's the implementation that's the hardest. The people who do the best 
are people who understand that execution is everything. Ideas, as you said, are great, but they're nothing without, an ex without execution. I really, really believe that. You know, I've had a bunch of ideas that people have then started off businesses and I was like, oh God, I had that idea. Yeah, but I didn't execute. Yeah, and that's what I love about what you're saying is like, it's great to have that inspiration and then just take immediate action within seven days, you know. Yeah. Uh, I, in fact, I've been using that discipline, setting up my midlife entrepreneur. I decided I didn't want to spend more than 100 pounds setting yeah. it up. I'm so far at 70 pounds. Yeah. <laughs> I got 30 pounds left to blow on something. But yeah. yeah, it was like there were so many online courses I could have taken for hundreds and hundreds of uh, dollars. And it was like, well, I'm sure I could figure that out by just putting a bit of effort in. And uh, actually, Pat Flynn of Smart Passive Income, who I follow a lot, he, he's got a great book called Will It Fly, which is that very thing of like how to take that initial idea and test it and see whether it's got mm -hmm. any validity. And it's a great book. I can really recommend that. Uh, so, yeah, so I think that just sort of taking action in iterative steps so every day, do one little thing, which means your idea is becoming real. It's so powerful. Yeah. Well, I'd I recommend a second book to, to back that one up called Lean Startup by Eric Ries. And, and, and it's all about stop having assumptions and just test them out. You know, then it can get the, 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 the dark side of lean startup is that it gets rid of any instinct. Any, any gut feeling or instinct gets eradicated by data driven results. It's like, okay, that's, you, you think that's what people want, but is it what they really want? And, and just to, just to loop, I forgot to loop, to finish the loop with the, with the Noah Kagan and Tim Ferriss interview. The reason why I mentioned that is that there's an entrepreneur who's on the show and he's there to sell these, um, toothbrushes that if you sell a toothbrush a kid in need gets one and he's got a prototype it's not the final product because it'll be made out of plastic or something but this one's the prototype he has is a mold and it's in bamboo and he's talking about this and no one's really getting excited and noah kagan steps in at one point and he goes do you mind and he goes yeah he goes because he heard tim ferry say basically oh, i think it's really cool the bamboo one and so noah kagan it's a beautiful piece you should really check it out noah kagan literally goes so Tim, you like this? He goes, yeah, like, would you buy this? He's like, yeah, like, how much would you pay for this? He's like, I don't know, like, 20, 20 bucks? And he's like, cool, have you got your wallet on you? He's like, no, it's in the back. He's like, go and get it. Go and, go and get, like, but, and, that, and it's so, and everyone's laughing, but no, and Noah King is like, why am I doing this? I should, you know, you should be doing this. And then the guys resist basically what happens, which is a brilliant, because you really have to see this to understand. It's a typical example of when people are not listening. This guy is going, no, no, but I'm not making bamboo toothbrushes and making this plastic one and no Kagan goes all right people in the audience raise your hand if you'd be interested in buying a bamboo toothbrush and then all these hands go up and he goes who wants to buy a plastic toothbrush <laughs> no one you know and, he, and, and, he, and the guy's still resisting and Noah Kagan's going look this is what's going on here you're not listening you're not paying attention to what people are telling you and at one point literally no Kagan goes anyone watching online if you if you want this toothbrush paypal 20 bucks What's your email? And the guy says the email to this address. And I think you, get, you got like a thousand orders, something like that. Yeah. So yeah, that listen is, to your audience. Yeah, listen, because you might, you might, you might start going, okay? You might start going, even you might start going like, okay, I'm doing mid, you know, midlife or I forgot the, the term you're using, midlife entrepreneurs, right? That's it. Yeah. And that you might go, okay, my, then you might have an idea of what a product or solution you're sending them, right? You, that you're providing, you're helping people going, hey, I've got a six-step process to help you go from idea to launch you know, with, 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 without having to put your house on them, you know, without having to remortgage your house yeah. or sell your kids off to, to you know, whatever. <laughs> and and that, that might be it, but actually what, the, you know, and then you go off and you test this out and what you're hearing over and over and over again is, I just don't think I can do it. So then you go, hey, I've got a confidence session. It's 90 minutes. And in 90 minutes, you walk out of there knowing that you have absolutely what it takes to start a business, no matter how old you are. Would mm -hmm. that be of interest? Yes. And so then you, then you start realizing that's the product. That's what people want. I mean, I just, that's just a really quick example, but you'll, you'll notice very quickly if you pay attention. No, I, I've been finding, uh, you know, Facebook uh, surveys that you can do. Just put a quick question on Facebook, yeah. ask people to respond to some of your ideas. And then the, the, the powerful bit is there's a bit underneath that says, what do you think? And then they can put in their ideas, uh, which is how my middle-aged entrepreneur website went to midlife entrepreneur. Because yeah. I kept having people in their sort of early 30s going, hey, I want to join. I was like, ah, oh, you're too young. You know, I had this line yeah. in my head of 40 yeah. plus. So it yeah. doesn't matter. As you say, it's a state of mind. It's not an age. I love it. Did you get midlifeentrepreneur.com? Uh, .net. Yeah. 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 Someone had insane. .com and wanted lots of money for it, which I haven't got. But maybe one yeah. day if it takes off. Well, here's, here's the thing. Here's something perspective. Noah Kagan, I think, paid three or four million dollars for his website, sumo.com. Wow. 
But when I get three or four million dollars, anything, and he thinks it was bargain. Wow. Thanks. So, so just you know, um, depending on how much we can talk about this offline, but depending how much they ask, sometimes it's worth. If you, if, if you think it's going to be something that's going to stick, a URL can. It's like real estate, basically. Yeah, dot com. Well, look, uh, I know we're we're getting near the end of our time, so I'm just going to yeah. ask you one more question. So, what's next for you on your entrepreneurial journey? Well, it's interesting because I've just gone through a process where I've, I've now really separated myself from, from the business in the sense that, so the unconventionalist.com has now got its own like, kind of website. It's, it's a podcast, it's online courses, it's in-person workshops, it's accelerators. It's like this whole kind of ecosystem to help uh, entrepreneurs who want to make a difference, right? And get all the tools and mindsets and all this stuff. And then there's the markroos.com, which is now going to be a separate website, which I'll be launching at the end of the month. And that really is positioning me more as a speaker and, and as a trainer and to go and do the circuits around conferences and companies. And, and I love doing that. So mm. I get to do the, my, my, my two, two big things I love in life are interviewing people and talking on stage. So that's what I'm doing. And I, you know, yeah, I mean, it's pretty crazy, but that's what I do. And I get paid for it. Even better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I'd, I'd, I'd add a fifth or six points of the last thing. It's just people need to really quickly fall in love with money so fast. Fix your, fix your story with money. Like one of the deep work that you need to do really quickly as an entrepreneur is figure out what your relationship is to money. If you want to figure out what your relationship to money is, do this exercise. It was Daniel Priestley who taught me this. Um, get a thousand pounds, right? Get a thousand pounds out in cash, put it in your wallet and walk around with it for a week notice everything that comes up for you even as i say these words notice what comes up for you in feelings write that down it's going to give you straight away you don't need to do six years of therapy to figure out what your money relationship is that exercise alone will trigger so much inside of you that you'll find out a lot about what your relationship to money is and once you heal that once you fix that once you work with it it's just so much easier to kind of make money as as, as an entrepreneur that's what i think yeah and i think also that thing of you know, when you're figuring out how much to charge, figure out, well, how much do you need to live every week, every day? You know, what is that amount? Yeah. Is it 100 pounds a day you need? Well, then that becomes your rate. If you only have one, <clears throat> one client or one sale a day, then it's 100 pounds. That's, yeah. that's how you work it out. Yeah, it's yeah. not like yeah. what everybody else is charging or how much do you, do you think it's worth? It's like, well... It's, it's, yeah, it's totally abstract, especially if you're in the coaching consulting world. You just need to get away from like, I can never charge this. It was too little. It's, there's no too little or too much. What feels right? It's like, I think Karina Gordon Barnes told me this one. It was like, the ha your happy price. I have a friend brainstorm. Like, let's say, say okay, I'm, let's say you're, you're listening to this and you're a consultant and you want to help, I don't know, businesses with systems and something like that. And you're like, I don't know how much to charge. And you go, okay. Um, so for like a night, like, like an hour, if I gave you two pounds, would you be happy? No. And you do this incrementally, right? 10, 15, 20, 30. Yeah, I mean, 30 is cool. 40 is cool. 50, yeah, 60, woo, 70 too much. Like you'll, you'll feel it straight away. Yeah. And then you start with that. And then that's one way of doing it. I think you should definitely do the way that you just said, the logical way, which is how much you need. Um, but I think it's so interesting that people, I'll give you an example, because I know we've got to, unfortunately we've got to wrap it up, but um, I spent 10 years pretty much in sales, in some shape or form in sales, right? And I've raised, or I've raised or sold what the common of about 10 million new euros. Okay. Across that, that decade mm -hmm. for companies and charities and all this stuff. When I started off, I, I, sque I was squeamish at the idea of charging 20 pounds for an hour back then. It's a different story. Like, I just want to say this to people listening to this, working for a company, selling a product for someone else is one thing, selling your own service and product, all sorts of stuff is going to come up. And that's why you need someone like Kevin to walk you through it. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate that. And thanks for your time today. And it's been really inspiring hearing your journey, you know, these last seven years or your, your whole life, really, to get to yeah. this point. And I hope we can both inspire people to, you know, take that nebulous idea and, and step out into the world with it and to just start making it happen. Because, you know, somebody yeah. somewhere in the world would want the thing that you're thinking is worthwhile. You know, there's, there's a, yeah. an audience out there somewhere. You just got to yeah. find it. Your, your friendship over the years and, and it's been great that we kept in touch and, and I'm glad we both stepped into that room seven years ago. Yeah. Wow, yeah. Yeah, so if only we could go, go back to... So yeah, that's a great question to end on. If you could go back to that moment in the room when we did Fundamentals in February 2012, yeah. what, what would you whisper in your ear? What piece of advice? 
Uh, I don't know if I would because everything just turned out exactly. I would say, enjoy the ride. Enjoy the ride. That's yeah, I, I would say I would say enjoy the ride, and uh, don't, don't 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 overthink it. Don't overthink it and enjoy the ride. Yeah. Excellent yeah. piece of advice. Well, have a good day, Mark. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much. Today's show was brought to you by Audible. Audible is offering you, dear listener, a free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership. Just go to audibletrial.com forward slash midlife. The link is in the show notes so you can get started listening today to an audiobook that will help you turn your entrepreneurial ideas into reality. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Midlife Entrepreneurs Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, then please do subscribe to my podcast and leave a review as it helps other people discover the podcast and helps me to keep doing this work. So until the next time, stay inspired about your vision, take action and bring your vision to the world.